Um, we're on season two now. We're moving along. Um, we're going to start with episode 209 today. So 209 is called The Trick is to Keep Breathing. Um, this is the episode before the mid-season finale of season two. And it's the, they call it in this episode the spring formal, but it's not actually the spring formal. It's really their junior prom. They're just calling it something different. Um, it originally aired on November 16th, 2004, and was directed by John Asher. This was John Asher's first episode. Um, he would continue directing episodes through season six, um, and would have a total of seven episodes that he directs. He did a pretty good job with this. It was written by James Patrick Sturrux uh, and Chad Fibish, who I've talked about before in previous episodes. They've already done um, episode 303. Um, it was also a pretty well-written episode. Um, the Nathan and Haley rift stuff that's about to go, ha go on further in the season, it's already sort of started. They already started laying the groundwork, um, especially in the last episode, right, where... Nathan and Lucas went to Charlotte for the basketball game and, and ultimately the doctor uh, appointment. Um, and Haley lied to Nathan in that episode about her going and working with Chris. This episode, it starts to come out, though, and they start to like show us the problems between Nathan and Haley because Nathan finds out um, that she worked with Chris while he was in Charlotte he plays her music, which she gets upset about because that music's not finished, but ultimately that's not the problem here. The problem is her working with Chris and lying to Nathan about it, and ultimately just the whole Chris thing. It's interesting, really, and I've, I've been, you know, thinking about this rewatching it um, in general with the character of Chris, because in this season, he's a very, he's a serious character, right? Like, there's a serious problem between Nathan and Haley. In this season, he's a real threat um, in terms of their relationship, and he plays the role serious, despite him being like he's a complete douchebag. <laughs> and to a degree, he, he that continues into you know when we see him in the next season. But if you look at the the series as a whole, he goes so far from this character, not just him being like completely unlikable, but him just being taken seriously. By the time you get to when we see him last, uh, he's more of a joke type of character. Not, you know, not somebody who's like, not necessarily the same um, as Tim. Uh, you take him a little bit more seriously than that, and you care about his character a little bit more, I guess. But it, it's definitely, he's more of a comedic relief moving forward versus what he originally started as. And I feel like that's mainly um, Tyler Hilton there, and the fact that they on the show really liked Tyler Hilton and wanted him to continue coming back. Especially in season... You see a little bit in season three, which is... Season three, his character isn't really a joke because we know some stuff that happens in that season as well. It's still, like, very serious and him being a douchebag and causing problems and all this. But... He's... still He's still there, and but he's showing comedic chops. He's showing that in season three despite still being the same character he is in season two and they were able to play on that in future seasons to make him more of a comedic character um so also you know this is a and i mentioned with nathan and Haley stuff it's a very emotional episode um it's a very it's, it's very good um lucas learns about dan's health in this episode which um adds to the dan and lucas relationship in this season and building on that and building on Lucas and his detective work throughout the season um, and finding out stuff about Dan and Dan's reaction to it. And Dan's so quick on his feet in this season. Because um, there's certain things that like Dan is like, he's being honest with, right? And he's trying to have this honest relationship with Lucas and he's trying to do all this. But he was quick on his feet to find out ways to get around the things he's actually done this bad. Like lying to Deb, right? He tells Lucas, you know, it's because he wants to try to get his family back and such and such. And to a degree, maybe he is. Um, I'm really diving into that, like, when I'm rewatching this season of how much he actually wanted to try to get Deb back because I... 
I don't really think that he had that in mind at all. Like, ultimately trying to do anything with Deb. I think he was over Deb at this point. I think that was all... I feel like after the whole Keith thing, Dan was... He saw Deb completely differently. At least until, you know, later on when he's, like, reflecting back over his life. But, um... I think that relationship is, is, is over. And I think that the whole... Everything in this season for Dan, not with Lucas outside of that, is motivated by the revenge from the heart attack and just the fact that Keith and Deb slept together. Um, so, I mean, that that's part of the whole line about the health. It's all of that stuff is his ultimate game plan of getting revenge on both Keith and Deb. Um, so we start to focus more on Brooke and Lucas in this episode as well taking us back into to them and what their relationship was and what it could be um, and hinting at a future with them while also just like building on their friendship that we haven't really seen because they were just in relationship and then they weren't and we never, we never really saw them as friends and now we're about, we're about to see that um, develop in season two before the end of the, end of the season and what ultimately happens but um, that starts in this episode at the end, you know, we have the Felix and Mouse stuff, Felix continuing to be a douchebag, um, the reveal that Felix bought the dollhouse for Mouth to give to Brooke, Mouth taking Brooke home after she gets drunk a trick, and Felix coming in and pretending that he did it, and then in this episode, Mouth reveals that to Brooke about what happened, and Brooke ends things with Felix, um, for a second, and ultimately we find, we know that Mouth gets drunk and throws in, uh, something at Brooke's windshield, breaking it. Um, which then leads Brooke to being upset, and then Luke's, Lucas finds her on the beach, and that leads into the friendship that they're building on. Um, then going back to the Nathan and Haley stuff, she also finds out that he turned down High Flyers because he didn't want to be away from her for the summer, um, and wanted to, you know, not risk anything for their relationship. So there's a, there's a lot of stuff that happens to this. It kind of you know just in, in, oh also you can't forget the um, the Peyton stuff that happens in this episode. Continuing to build on her fact that she's alone and her mental state at the time. Her mom's dress that gets ruined because some douchebag spills a drink on it. Um, and her turning back to coke, uh, which she ultimately doesn't do. And the stuff with Anna, too, that starts to build on, like, her, like, what were the rumors in the past? We start to, like, figure that stuff out through the next few episodes. Um, how she re reacts to Peyton and Felix's joke and all of that. So, uh, it was a very, I think it's, a, it's a, actually a very good episode. And it leads us into the next episode, which is the mid-season finale, which is episode 210, Don't Take Me For Granted. This episode aired November 30th, 2004. Um, it was the last episode to come out in 2004. Obviously, it's the mid-season finale. Um, it was directed by Lev L. Spire, um, who only directed one episode. I'm very surprised that he directed the mid-season finale, especially considering this was his first episode and he never went on to direct more. Um, I would I would have thought that Greg Prange or a few of the other directors who have done multiple ones would have directed this one. But uh, it was it was a good episode. It's, I think it's one of the best of season two. Um, it was written by Mark Schwann, of course, because it is the mid-season finale, and he directs most of the bigger episodes to happen throughout the series. Um, it continues, like I said, just from the last episode, and we have a lot of stuff that happened in this episode. We have the whole s Brooke finds out that her windshield was smashed, um, and you know later Mouth reveals that to Lucas that he was the one that did it. Um, Brooke thinks that Felix did it, causing you know, her to be mad at him, flattens his sirens on this, which, you know, ultimately at the end of the episode, uh, I keep saying ultimately, I'm sorry, uh, at the end of the episode, her and Felix actually start a relationship, they start dating, uh, which is just disgust disgusting, um, but you also have this stuff with Peyton's locker, that someone wrote Dyke on Peyton's locker, and there's really not that big of a suspense, feel like, uh, a feel throughout the show um, leading up to the reveal of who that is. I don't know if it was like 
I feel like they plan for it to be like a reveal, so I don't know why they didn't like ask a question like who who could have done it. I guess the ca the characters just think that just some random person did it. Um, we find out that it definitely wasn't just a random person. I know she was targeted by one of the other characters who obviously it's Felix. We we know that. Um, if you've watched the show before, you know that, and that becomes a big point when he ends up leaving the show. That happens. Peyton wears this shirt with that written on it in to, into the school. Uh, principal Turner, who's also like one of the worst principals, right? Like, I was thinking about that one in the last episode that I watched, um, which is not in the set, set here. Um, but that he had a, like a speaking role, and, and he's actually principal from like the time the, the show starts through, um, I guess, into season six. I, I know he's through season five, and they obviously have a a new principal in season six. But yeah, he's uh, not a not a good guy, really. I and mean, we find out in season four, I think he's like a. It's like a, a little bit of a line that he like sexually harassed Rachel, I feel like. But anyways, we'll get to that when we get to it. Peyton deals with that stuff. Um, ultimately, she goes back and she's going to buy coke from that Rick guy who is a, is a terribly written character. I don't understand why he was in, ever in the show. Like They could have came up with a better way to write a drug dealer. Because he's, he's supposed to be this guy who's like controlling all the bands on the... Uh, can't remember the word he used, but it was pretty much like the East Coast in that area or whatever. Like, dude, you wouldn't be in Tree Hill. You'd be like in Atlanta or New York or something. Um, the circuit, that's what he says. The He controls every band on the circuit. And I'm like, I feel like you would be in Atlanta or whatever. Like, you would not be in Tree Hill. You would not be wearing a button-up with a tank top underneath it, hanging out with, like, high schoolers. Like, it's just, it's kind of stupid. Um, but... When she goes to buy the, the coke at the end, Jake shows up, which leads us into her storyline for the, pretty much the rest of the season. Um, Lucas breaks up with Anna in this episode uh, because he, you know, is still uh, has feelings for Brooke, and that ends with him going to see Brooke and finding her kissing Felix. Karen finds out about Lucas's heart condition um, from Nathan which surprises Lucas um, because he thinks that Dan is the one that told her, told him, yeah, told her about uh, Lucas, but it's not, it was Nathan. Um, so she's very upset about it, and Lucas is upset that she found out and still saying he's not going to take the exam. Um, Deb and Karen, we have that sort of cliffhanger where uh, Deb finally tells Karen that she slept with Keith, and sort of causes a problem between them. It was, it's not, and I kind of was like, why is she that upset? Because, you know, Karen treated Keith kind of bad. And, but ultimately it, it wasn't that she slept with him, it was that she lied about it to Karen. And then we also have the Dan and Jewel stuff. That reveal is in this episode where Keith calls and leaves a message on Jewel's phone that he loves her, which there's some questionable things that Keith does. Like, why would he do that over a phone message? But whatever. For the scene, it, it was set up good. I, I liked it for the scene. Because in that in that moment, the camera pans from the phone over to Jules. And then you hear laughter. And then it pans over to Dan, who's drinking scotch, sitting there. And he's like, you know, everything is going as planned, Jules. Which was a pretty good, pretty good moment for a mid-season finale, I think. Um, and sets up. A lot of stuff is about to happen through the next few episodes, um, and it was just a good reveal, I think. And then, we, then we go into the mid-season premiere, which is episode 11 of season 2, The Heart Brings You Back. This originally aired January 25th, 2005, and it was directed by Max Shackman, um, who only did one episode, but he went on, he directed an episode of Mad Men, actually, which is another one of my favorite shows. And he's the guy who's going to be directing WandaVision uh, for Marvel. Yeah, he's direct. it looks like he's directing the whole season of WandaVision. So I thought that was interesting. Um, it was written by Mark B. Perry, who previously direct, uh, wrote um, episode 4 of season 1 and episode 2 of season 2. Who, and he directs a total of 4. Uh, <laughs> he writes a total of 4 episodes overall. 
this episode kind of continues from the last one. Now, it's, now we're on three episodes that kind of like bleed into each other. Um, Taylor shows up in this episode, Haley's sister, um, one of her sisters, one of her, I guess, three sisters technically, because we know there's a sister called Vivian, um, but we never see her, so <sighs> her whole sibling thing is a little bit weird, because they set it up that she has a lot of siblings, that she has three sisters, but there's a, we know there's a Vivian out there, and I think there's supposed to be some brothers too, but we never see any of them, and we only ever see... Taylor and Quinn, who Quinn is mentioned in this episode. I think that's, uh, I like that, because obviously Quinn comes in in season seven, the first episode of season seven, and becomes a main character from then to the end of the show. So the fact that she was mentioned in season two is cool. I, I like that. I like laying the groundwork for things, characters, storylines, whatever. Um, and it, it made it better for when she showed up, because it wasn't like, Oh, you know, who is this? We never heard of her before. Um, but I do think they should have showed the other siblings, uh, especially for something that does happen in Season 7 uh, when we get to that. Um, here we go. We learn more of Andy's backstory in this episode. We find out that he um, hit a lady with his car, and he, he still goes and checks on her. Uh, Karen obviously thinks that he has seen another woman in New York. Um... So that becomes an issue throughout the episode, but ultimately they're fine at the end of it. But it does build on Andy's backstory, which I think is, is good and better. Makes It makes his character uh, well-rounded. Um, Chris leaves, but Jake sees uh, him and Haley kiss, which, you know, leads some seeds there where Peyton, how she's going to feel about Haley and confronting Haley in a future episode about it. Um, and Lucas finds out about Jules. Now, he finds out about her first and confronts her, and Jules kind of finds her way out of the uh, situation. But then Lucas does more detective work and finds out that she was lying. So Jules tells him the truth, um, adds to her backstory of why she's in this situation to begin with, and leaves Lucas even more conflicted because now he's not sure how, Luke, uh, how Jules really feels about Keith and what to do about the situation. Felix and Lucas fight in this episode. Uh, this is the second time that they've, they've fought. Um, this one happens on the river court, and Felix just adds to his character. Like, he's just a, such, such a punk. Um, you know, it's a bitch move. He, like, Lucas wins the fight, essentially, and then Felix, like, pulls his foot, makes him fall, and, like, hits, hits his head on the, um, the bench, and then, you know, like, kicks him and stuff. And it's just, like, it adds to how much of a douche Felix is. Um, and Anna reveals to Lucas that she is a lesbian in this episode. Um, so, yeah, it adds to her character as well. Obviously, everything that has been happening, the hinting at in the past few episodes finally comes out in this episode, um, to the audience, at least. And then we go into episode 212, Between Order and Randomness. Uh, this episode came out um, February 1st, 2005, and it was directed by Bethany Rooney, who had did a uh, total of four episodes between season two and season four. Um, it was written by Terrence, uh, Ter Terrence Colley, sorry. And he had previously done episode 17 of season one, Spirit of the Night, and episode 206 in season two. Um, solid episode. Um, it's one of those that it's not like a mid-season finale or anything or any kind of big episode. It's just a very good episode um karen's upset about the, in this episode obviously about lucas and giving him a hard time about not taking the test and taking things away from him try to break him try to make him go take that exam uh lucas confronts dan in this episode about jules and that situation which once again dan's quick on his feet um he doesn't deny it which is nice he tells lucas that he did do it um, and then reveals why he did it which reveals to lucas that keith and deb slept together which, you know, adds to Lucas being conflicted about everything, about the Jules situation, about Keith, about... I mean, it doesn't change, like, make him dislike Keith or anything, but it's a problem. Like, it's, it's it's not a cool thing that he did, and Lucas has some feelings about it. Um, Nathan, obviously in the last episode, we found this out, but it continues into this one, that Taylor was the first girl Nathan ever had sex with, um, and this was several years ago when he was a freshman, uh, but 
this episode, he finally decides to tell Haley about it because he wanted to keep it from her to begin with because obviously that would be an awkward thing for them to talk about and it would probably bother Haley, obviously. Um, so he decides to tell Haley about it in this episode because Taylor kind of sort of blackmailing him uh, into it. Um, so he tells her, and Haley gets really mad at first, uh, which it just, Haley's character in this season is the worst. Uh, she's, I like Haley a lot in season one. Um, from season two on, I'm not a huge fan of Haley, especially in season two. It's, she's definitely the worst in season two. Um, and there's some redeeming th things about her throughout the course of the show. I know a lot of people like her character. Um, just not one of my favorites. And... Yeah, just, I mean, I don't know how she could be upset at Nathan at all for this when she has a present, when that's what Taylor tells her to. And, you know, I like how this episode kind of shows more with Taylor, too, because she starts off with this, like, unlikable character. And then, you know, she's trying to uh, do things for herself, right? She's trying to blackmail Haley, Nathan, both into finding, you know, getting her a place to stay. But ultimately, she's looking out for Haley's best interest and trying to uh, be a, a good sister, despite how she is. Um, and she, you know, clearly has a soft spot for Nathan as well. Um, and at the end of this episode, Keith proposes to Jules. Once again, like I said, Keith makes some questionable decisions uh, in the course of the show, especially um, with, you know, relationships. Like, you propose... Like, you really want to get married. Like, season one, you proposed to Karen. You guys weren't even dating yet. I know the history they had between them, but, like, they weren't even dating. Why would you propose? And now Jules, like, they've been dating, like... I'm trying to... I, I've came up in the past with, like, the timeline of the show and, like, how everything plays. Season two starts in February of their junior year in high school. I think season one is from October to February, and then season two is from February to June. Um, so this episode would have taken place in, this would be April. Yeah. So he proposes to Jules in April, but when we go back to the episode that him and Jules meet, that would have been in February. So they've been dating for like less than two months, though. Less than two months, like a month and a half probably they've been dating. And he's already proposed. Kind of, kind of crazy. And uh, Lucas finds out about it, and you know, I think that's the point where he's like, "I can't tell Keith the truth now. I just have to see how everything goes and how it plays out." Another thing about this episode um, is the a filming location, and that's uh, Carl's Crab Shack. Um, I haven't really, I feel like I haven't really talked about much about filming locations, and that's a big part of the show. Um, Tree Hill itself, and the cast that's spoken about this, and creators and the directors, how Tree Hill is a character in itself in the show. Um, Wilmington was a huge part of the show, not just that it was filmed there, because if you look at Dawson's Creek, which is another show that I really like, but Dawson's Creek was filmed in Wilmington, but it wasn't, it wasn't a character in the show, I don't think. Because it was supposed to be um, Cape Side. It was a fictional town still, but it wasn't in North Carolina. It was in Massachusetts, and it was its own. It was trying to be something else. Wilmington, or Tree Hill is a fictional version of Wilmington. So they really dive into making this Tree Hill and that being a big character in the show, and I think they do a good job doing that. Um, but like I said, in this, in this episode, episode 12... We get Carl's Crab Shack, and this is actually Real Cafe, the Real Cafe in Wilmington. Um, it's a pretty good restaurant. You guys should check it out if you're there, maybe. Um, I haven't been there recently, so I don't know how the food is, if you want to, what you're into. Um, they used to have some good wings. I don't eat, personally, I don't eat chicken anymore, but they used to have good, some hot, good hot wings there, um, and they used to have some good drinks. But, yeah, so it's filmed at Real Cafe. Um, a lot of the cast actually used to go to Real Cafe when the show was being filmed there, and they have posters on the wall of Winter Hill and Dawson's Creek, as well as um, some other restaurants and stuff around town that have this as well, especially if one of the shows was filmed there. They usually put up a poster or pictures on the wall 
and a lot of times they're signed by the cast. Um, Hell's Kitchen is uh, another one that I still go to. Um, I definitely recommend Hell's Kitchen. They have a good um, vegetarian and vegan selection if you're into that. Um, but it's in this episode, uh, season season two. It's in episode um, 18, so we'll get to that so sooner. Um, and it was also in Dawson's Creek, and they have posters, and they're signed and everything, and it's, it's really cool. I definitely recommend Hell's Kitchen. Um, they have a good seafood selection as well. But yeah, filming locations. So we also have Trick in this season. Um, Trick was shown in season one. I've already mentioned that, I think. But it becomes a big part of this season and throughout the course of the rest of the show. Um, been there a few times, took in pictures. I've uh, taken pictures. Um, used to, when they were filming the show, they had the stairs coming down the back, and you could actually walk up part of them. You couldn't go up all the way. They would have, like, a fence blocking you from going up all the way. But they had, you know, the entrance at the back, the top. Um, a lot of people came out and would, like, write on the wall. It's one of them I wrote on the wall. Um, <laughs> it's crazy thinking about some of this stuff because people at certain filming spots, they did a lot. Like, the river court, the river court especially. All over the river court, like, the actual court, the benches, um, the little picnic area out there, all of that people would take Sharpies and write over and, like, just talk about the show, memories, their name, whatever. So, like, every time that they would film there, they would have to cover that shit up. They would have to cover that shit up or they'd shoot around it. So, like, that would... <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine having that job, but... They did that with Trick, too. A lot of people would sign the wall. So, like, if they filmed a scene outside with the cast in front of the wall, like, they would have to cover that up. Now, in season two, they probably didn't have to worry about that. I don't imagine that they had that many fans that came to Wilmington to watch filming back then. I know Paul Johansson's talked about that um, before. I can't remember if it was in a, an interview on the, on the DVD or if it was just me listening to him talk with other people in person about it. But because by the time that I started going, a lot of people were going to watch filming. And that was in season uh, five and six. That's around the time I started going. And I'll talk about that when we get to those episodes. But, yeah, by that point, people were coming from all over the world, France especially, uh, different areas, to watch filming. And he mentioned how, like, in the early days, season one and two, they didn't have people coming to watch filming like that. So I imagine it was a lot easier, both to film and just the set pieces and whatnot like that. But, yeah, but in the later seasons, you had some people, like... You had to control the crowd, like people like make sure they're in the shots around Karen's got face, and you know fans walk, walk uh, hanging out across the street, uh, signing stuff, all of that. Karen's Cafe is another uh, filming location that we could talk about here. Um, it also becomes another location in the show. We'll talk about that later. Um, but that was on the corner of Front and Grace. Uh, originally, I think in the pilot they shot. Karen's Cafe across the street at um, Port City Java. There's two Port City Javas downtown, by the way, but this is the one uh, across the street from the actual Karen's Cafe location. That's where they filmed it. It was a small location. And actually, in season nine, they go back and film at that location for a different uh, restaurant. I think it's called Tree Hill Cafe or whatever. But uh, now it's weird because, when, of course, while they were filming it, it was just a set. Um, Nothing was actually there, and I wish that when the show had ended, they had actually made it into a real cafe. That would have been really cool, um, but they didn't. They ended up just getting rid of it, and now it's a sports or outdoor store, I think. Um, just like the River Court, when the show ended, they were um, they they talked to the city of Wilmington. They were like, "Do you want to leave it here?" Or do you want us to tear it up, you know? And and for and for some reason, and this is something I'll never understand, Wilmington didn't want to take it uh, take it upon their responsibility to keep up with it. I don't know if it was just Wilmington or if it was the battleship area or whatever, but it was uh, it's very uh, lame, I think. You know, like, imagine how many people come there just for the filming locations, tourism, all this stuff, and you take a site that would have been very easy to keep up as far as, you know, just... You didn't have to keep it a, a working basketball area. You could have even taken down the post, but just left the court. But nah. So they tore up the river court, uh, but you can still go to that spot. I definitely recommend it. If you go to Wilmington, even if you're not like a fan of the show, which I mean, you're not going to be watching this video if you're not, but 
Um, yeah, definitely recommend that spot. It has some great views. The last episode that we're going to talk about here is episode 13 of season 2, The Hero Dies in this one. This is a big episode, um, not just for the show, but for me as well. It originally aired on February 8th, 2005. It was directed by Kevin Dowling, and uh, he also directs an episode of season 2, uh, uh, or season 3, the second episode of season 3, and it's written by Jennifer Cecil, who had previously uh, written um, episode 3 of season 1 and episode 4 of season 2. This is the episode that hooked me. This was the episode of One Tree Hill that I started watching, and I never stopped watching after this. Um, the first episode I remember, well, I think it was actually the Boy Toy Auction, the first episode I remember seeing anything of in One Tree Hill. But the season 1 finale was the um, the episode that I remember watching the entirety of, uh, but then in season when season two started, there was still like episodes that I didn't watch or like fully watch. You know, I seen bits and pieces. But this episode two thirteen was the episode that I watched, and it got me hooked, and I didn't stop watching after that. So it's a it's a big episode for me. Um, it's it's a very emotional episode, in, you know, in terms of Haley and Nathan and what happens with them and how that plays into definitely the rest of the season and a big part of season three. Um, Brooke with running for student council, like student student class president, in this episode. I love the music. I feel like this even this episode like really punched into me with uh, how important music was to the show. Not just for for Haley um, and Chris Keller and all that, like the musical performances on the show, but also like the music fitting the scene uh, and that making a difference to me. Me understanding that. Um, as a kid, you know, the, the, the coda of this episode, the, the end of this episode with, you know, Nathan seeing the flashback and running back to Haley, um, and then the final shot of this episode that I love so much where he, like, picks up the piano and throws it, and it breaks the, um, the mural that they have, of uh, both of them together from the wedding, cracking that in half, and the piano, or the keyboard, uh, breaking, and then him sitting down with his uh, head in his hands. A gr pretty great shot. Uh, Kevin Dowling did a, a good job directing this episode. Um, Surprised he only did two of the, of the whole show. But yeah, this was, a, this was a very good way to end this video. Um, the next video, we'll be talking about the next four episodes. Um, so check it out, guys, and check it. If you haven't seen my other videos about Winter Hill, check those out as well. Thank you.